So design and cosmology and causality, what you call uh, cause and effect, are self-evident in nature. And all of that come together and they give voice to speak of God's creative power and his divine nature and his intelligence and his manifold goodness. It is inescapable. You see it every day. You interact with it every day. Every single time you deal with somebody and feel any kind of kindness or love and compassion or goodwill, what you're actually experiencing is God in action. Because human beings by their very nature, and they're not always good. And so when you experience good coming from another person to you, this is God in that person. This is the reflected goodness that is derived from God, right? And that's, that's something and we cannot escape it. You eat an avocado, a fresh tomatoes, a fresh mango, uh, something that nourishes you and blesses you, you know, spinach, whatever it is you like to eat. This is God. This is providence. And this is the argument that, that Paul is making here. You cannot say that there is no God because even all of nature represents him to you in a very powerful way. Every single day, you drink a glass of clean water. Where do you think that water came from? You enjoy a salad with some cherry tomatoes and you bite into it and you, you suck down the juice and it blesses you and you like it. Where do you think it comes from? Where do you think you come from? Paul says, In and through these things, small and great things, you can sense God, you can see God in it, and you cannot escape it. So once again, you know, the concept of design and cosmology and causation is self-evident in life. And all of them come together to make a compelling argument for the existence of God. And so nature itself, all of nature, from beginning to end, although there is no end to nature, for God himself is nature, right? So all of that speaks to the very existence of God. And there is no way you can hide from it. You cannot hide from it. And so to the question, is it the case that there is no God? The answer has to be in the negative. There is a God because nature shows us God. Long before theologians came through and philosophers came through, the likes of Socrates and Plato and Aristotle and the whole slew of them, long before they began to philosophize and the theologians began to do their theology, sages and saints knew about God and they spoke about God. They often didn't have all the languages to describe him, but sometimes they didn't need language. Silence was enough. Huh? And they saw God in everything in nature. And that was sufficient. Okay? So God exists because nature shows us God plain and simple. And then, of course, there is the second, apart from, apart from na nature, there is a second witness, mountain of witness that is inescapable. And that has to do with the witness of Scripture. All over the world, in all sacred traditions, people wrote Scriptures as inspired by God. And all of these Scriptures together spoke about this one ultimate reality. Even when people didn't know that other people were experiencing the same thing in other parts of the world, people were writing and speaking and, and, and proclaiming this same ultimate reality. Of course, they did not call him the same thing. They called him different things. You know, in Africa, Africans called them different things depending on their tribal affiliation. The, the Asians didn't call him the same thing. You know, they called him different things. But it's the same ultimate reality they were describing. Right? And so the scriptures from all of these traditions 
and all of these sacred uh, experiences show that there is God. Now, here is a scripture from the Christian tradition, and this is taken from Psalm chapter 24. It says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and all they that dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the flood. This is from the Christian tradition. And it's consistent with the, the, the creation narrative. How God created the whole world and brought it into being. You can make an argument like this and say that the White House and the fullness thereof belongs to the Americans. They have founded it upon the district of Columbia and they have built it on Pennsylvania Avenue. This is so like equivalent argument. You know, and this will be correct, right? And I know because I used to live in Washington, D.C. I went to school in Washington, D.C. And you may be watching this and you're from American University. I went to American University myself, right? And so if you say that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, it's no different than saying that the White House is the Americans and, and the fullness thereof. Okay, that's it for now. Please put down your thoughts, your opinions, and your questions in the comment sections below. Until next time, like, share, subscribe, and don't forget to hit that notification bell for me. Thank you so much.